In life, we all encounter obstacles, and those obstacles come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. The question is, how do we handle those obstacles? Do we attack them head on, or do we allow them to make us quit? Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast, where we aim to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up on themselves, their dreams, or their goals. We will interview successful people from all walks of life as they share their no quit stories when they had the choice to give up or give in, but they didn't. We thank you for listening, and we hope to be that jolt of positivity as you go for your greatness. Welcome to episode number 166 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is grit. Our quote of the day comes to us from John Wayne. True grit is making a decision and standing by it, doing what must be done. No moral man can have peace of mind if he leaves undone what he knows he should have done. Today's episode is sponsored by the good people over at West Fair Communications, who publish the Westchester County Business Journal and the Fairfield County Business Journal. These newspapers do a wonderful job in covering all aspects of the business world within two of the most influential markets in the New York metropolitan area. You can also take advantage of their daily news feeds, which keep track on the companies and thought leaders in these important regions. For more information, take a look at www.westfaironline.com. Trust me, once you start reading, you won't quit. It is a complete honor to bring you today's episode. Our guest is a gentleman that is very well known throughout the basketball world. As he is considered one of the best basketball trainers in the world, what Gannon Baker does on the court is pretty amazing. However, on today's show, I'm just as, if not more impressed with what he has learned throughout his professional career over these last 18 plus years. I think we often forget just how powerful the mind and how important the right mindset can be. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Gannon, I'd like to welcome you to the No Good Living Podcast. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Congrats on your success, and uh, we'll have a good good session here. I appreciate it. So the first question I ask everybody is, are you ready to make it happen today? Well, you, you, you're born, and uh, you're, you're destined for greatness, and, and we sometimes either believe that or we, we mess that up. But, you know, today is going to either be a good or great day. That's my only choice. Yes, sir. Let's go. Oh, I love it. So... As we uh, spoke before we went live, the number one objective of our show is to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up. And I was curious if you had either a personal story or perhaps a really challenging time in your life that tested you and you could have given up or given in, but you didn't. Well, it's funny you ask, man, because I'm a former uh, high school, college and professional player, and it seems like I've been injured almost every year from the time I started playing basketball, which was eight to the time I finished you know, really playing basketball at 30. Uh, I've had a stress fracture in my feet about 11 times and uh, I've broken my fingers uh, four or five times. So just with that, you know, injuries ha- has never stopped me. And um, I'm a six foot white guy. And so the stats of a six foot white guy uh, making uh, division one and getting the scholarship is, is very rare. So when I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. I played for Boo Williams and I played for a guy named uh, Walter Brower at Hampton High School. And, you know, my, my friends played the race card with me. They kept saying that, you know, you're too white to play basketball, go play some white sports. And to me, success is colorblind and gender free. So somebody even gave me the stats of a six foot white guy playing uh, mid-major division one was like 0.001%. So I ended up getting 31 scholarships through a, 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 a you know hunger game work ethic and an unbelievable break break unbreakable faith in myself. So you know that was a no quit story. And then at the age of 30, I was invited to the Denver Nuggets um, tryout camp during the summer, and I made it through two or three cuts. And and the fact that as a 30 year old, being really a no name professional player that had a pretty good year in Iceland to even get invited to the camp. Uh, was phenomenal at the time. Kiki Vandeway was the GM and Jeff Blitzelik, uh was the head coach. Scotty Brooks, Adrian Dantley, Chip England were the assistant coaches and uh, Carmelo Anthony's rookie year. And h- here I am guarding Carmelo and trying to make a name for myself out there. Made it through uh, two cuts, but ended up breaking my finger and, um, you know, getting cut. Uh, but they said, hey, you're not good enough to play in the NBA, but man, you're good enough to train them. You want to stay out here and watch, see what we do. And 
I understand you run your own business. You could, you could, you could gain some, some knowledge and wisdom. So I did that. And since 2000, I've been running my own small business, started out with one card, one client, no social media. And now I've been to 47 countries, 46 States. Uh, it's my going into my 19th year doing it. Uh, 80% of small businesses fail. So I always put myself into the percentage of things that work. You know, people will tell you the percentage uh, of things that won't work. You know, 80% of small businesses fail. Well, I wanted to be in the 20% that do. You know what I mean? 0.001% of, uh, you know, 99% of high, high school players don't, you know, six foot and white, don't play Division One. Well, I wanted to be part of that 1% that, you know, 0.1% that played. So I always focus on what I could do and not what I couldn't do. And that's, in a short, you know, I know in the short parable there, that that's kind of some of my no quit quit stories as a player and as a businessman. No, I really appreciate that backstory. And here's maybe a tough follow up question, but in the 19 years you've been doing this and working with different players, who's the toughest or who's had the best no quit attitude that somebody you worked with? You know, I've been on the court with Kobe. I've worked out LeBron, Kevin Durant. Uh, I live with Amari Stoudemire, Tyson Chandler, to name a few. Worked out Maya Moore, probably the greatest female player I've ever been around. You know, Maya Moore's attitude was, was unreal. Her professionalism, her way that she approached a simple, you know, so to speak, off-season workout w- was phenomenal. But I'm, I'm going to give you a guy that, that most people have never heard about unless they grew up in Arkansas or are in Australia right now. I don't know how the bandwidth of your podcast, but a guy named Rodney Clark. Uh, 5'11 guard, um, you know, doesn't look like a player, looks more like a jockey uh, f- for, uh, you know, riding a horse. And uh, I had a chance to work him out at the Nike Skill Academies. He was rated as one of the top 25 players um, in, uh, in the country. Ended up going to Arkansas, transferred to Butler, ended up playing professionally in, in Australia and he uh, he got MVP in Australia. Now he's he's in Europe playing. 5'11", 155 pounds. Doesn't look like a player. A little step slow, um, but he worked out so hard that his feet bled. And it wasn't because of bad shoes. It wasn't. I mean, he just would push himself to the point of exhaustion. You know, Kobe calls it a blackout where nothing else matters mentally and physically except the moment and uh, the way he approached uh, mistakes in the workout when he hit the wall mentally and physically, it was always next play. It was always, Hey, can I do it again? He never lost his, his emotion negatively. He never showed negative emotion in his workouts. He always accentuated the positive. Like, you know, he, when, when he did something, something well, you know, he showed it. And when he didn't do something well, he hit it. So he camouflaged his weaknesses but he knew he was there and it was just his mental consistency and physical consistency. And, uh, and everybody wants to say, Hey, you know, me to say, Hey, Chris Paul or Derek Rose, some of the guys I've been in front of, but man, Rodney Clark, just, I ne- I'll never forget the kid, just his grit. If you know what I mean, and, you know, his resilience and resolve to his physical limitations and just the way he approached. Cause we worked out two weeks at a time and he just, was on every single uh, possession and, and repetition. That's awesome, and I really appreciate you you talk, touching on his story. And I think that's an interesting perspective of, of what you do is a lot of people work players out, whether it's a day here, day there, hour there. But when you yourself are really getting into with these guys each and every day, I know you see their mindset, their work ethic, their attitude. And I think a lot of times we see players and coaches on TV – and that's good and that's fun, but the reality is the best of the best, which we kind of touched on before we went live, they do all this stuff consistently behind the scenes when no one's watching. Oh, you're exactly right. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to have the power of the best. You know, they want the byproducts of the best, which is fine. They want the, the value of the best. But, you know, to get the champion's power, you got to go through the champion's pain. So I'm, I'm sure everybody uh, that's an athlete, or a basketball fan has studied Kobe and, you know, Kobe's going on these interviews and retirement tours and he constantly keeps talking about the 4 a.m.s, the 5 a.m.s, the monotony, the boredom, 
you know, there's a law out there that I try to fight myself every day. And I tell my clients and uh, my players and I even tell my kids that, you know, the law of familiarity, like things become familiar. That new toy, so to speak, on Christmas becomes old by February. And, and that's our life, e- even our passions. You know, sometimes it gets old, it gets stale. And so we got to continue to keep finding ways to motivate us, to keep searching for the treasure through all the dirt, to get that excitement, that childlike joy that, um, that we had when we first fell in love with that passion. Uh, and, and so for basketball, uh, after a workout one day at LeBron's camp, I was able to with Kevin Eastman uh, being an assistant director at LeBron's camp, and, and, and early in the years of the camp, I would I was able to work him out. And so after after the workout, I was like, LeBron, I, I also work out a lot of grassroots players, man, boys and girls. Is there any, you know, words of wisdom or, or, or an attitude that I can bring to them that you have, that you've made yourself great? I said, forget the 6'9", you know, 250. I said, you're a you're a machine, but is there any spiritual things that I can give them, that, a mindset that they can – have in their life and he said man well, you know once you fall in love with something and once you kind of understand that you, you could be good at it you know once you have after you have that faith he said man greatness is consistency and i never forgot that i kind of use that as a mantra sometimes when i uh advertise and brand my branding but but greatness he's right greatness truly is consistency every day no i love that and i i couldn't agree more as i think doesn't matter what you want to do in life, whether it's business, personal, relationship, consistency is key. So I wanted to ask you, Gannon, how do you define success or what does success mean to you? That's a good question. You know, I think success uh, to me is, number one, uh, doing what I love every day. Like personally, if, if I can get a chance to do something I love every day, uh, that's success. But it doesn't sacrifice my life. Like I have a responsibility to my family, my wife, three kids. I'm the bread breadwinner of the family. I have to, uh, you know, supply and, and feed them. So I, I can't be selfish and, and do things that I love to do that, that affects my family. So if you can do something you love every day and still have a balanced life, that's successful. And uh, on top of that is success to me is fulfilling your God given gifts. I think God, gives us a gift, a purpose, and if we're in his will and, and doing, uh, basically giving value to life and making this world better through a chemistry book, through uh, even taking out the garbage, through a janitor. You know, I'm a basketball teacher. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a unique business, but if I can make the world better through my platform, to me, that's success. Um, I, I know a lot of these great coaches, John Calipari, Pat Summit, Gina Emma. Like, they, they don't do it. And I've been around some of these guys. They don't do it just to win championships. Yeah, that's what they have to do. They have to keep their job to win. But it's more than that. It's, 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 it's making this world a more valuable place by, by, by being great on the platform that they're given. So to me, that's success. No, that's a, and that's a perfect definition. And why I love that question is there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's specifically individualized. So one of the things we always look to do is add value. And I was curious if you have a morning or a daily ritual or routine that you swear by. Yeah, that, that's another great question. I, I think for me, you know, uh, the older I get, the more I, I have to stay in my routine because my job is very physical. I'm on the court, I'm playing, uh, I'm sweating with the guys, I'm doing drills, I'm in different time zones, I'm in the air. So, uh, to me, every day I have to feed, I guess, if you will, my physical self, uh, my spiritual self, and my emotional self. So uh, a good routine for me is, is I don't like doing it because I did it when I played. And <laughs> I love sleep. I got to get seven, eight hours of sleep a night where I feel I can't function. But to, to me, it's getting up and, and getting the mind going at 6 a.m. You know what I mean? Moving. You got to get up and move. And, and so 6 a.m., I have complete silence. I live 500 yards from the beach. So I go outside. I hear the ocean. I, uh, I break out. You know, I'm a Christian. I break out my Bible. I, I'll read some self-help books and just get my mind spiritually into what I need to do to, 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 to be good, to have faith, to have love, to have peace, to have self-control, to be a leader uh, for not only my family but for others. And then I'll read some self-help videos, look at them or books, 
to get my, uh, uh, you know, my mindset right, my emotions right, my, my information right, because you can't change, right, without information. You can't grow without information. And so I, I, I do, I do my, my reading uh, for an hour. And then uh, at some point during the day, I'll move for an hour. I might do basketball. If I have workouts, you know, then I, uh, then I get my workout there. But, but number two, after my, my reading is, is my sweat. I got to sweat, man. You know, I got to sweat every day. And, uh, and number three, it, it's, it's that diet. It's that eating right. But uh, I guess a staple is a gallon of water. You know, my urine's got to be clear, man. If my urine is clear, I'm good. Now, if my, uh, my, my poo-poo is clear, then we got to call the cops and the doctor, man. Something ain't right. But, you know what I mean? And I tell kids that and they laugh. But it's a way to get them to understand that, you know, your body's 70% water. And uh, I think one thing that all affects us, you know, Chris, you, you, you could relate is stress, anxiety, you know, uh, stiffness in the body, toxins. And so the way to get that out your body is to do what I said, you know, get your mind right, get your spirit right, sweat, but then drink, drink a lot of water. So I, I, and I drink a gallon of water a day and I sweat every day and I get some uh, devotional time every day. So those three things, man, I've been doing since probably I was 21, 22 and uh, I swear by it, man. It, whether I'm in China, it's Australia, you know, I got to get those three things in to keep my body in a holistic, you know, mode so I can be the best version of myself, so to speak. No, it, it's so important that you touch on that because you shared some really good stuff. And I think that question, too, is just it's so key because there's so many amazing things that people do each and every day that are so simple but so important. So you mentioned books. I was curious. I wanted to ask you if you've read anything recently or if you're reading something that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Great, great question. I think books, you know, uh, pave the pathway for our uh, information, and, and information is the change agent if we want to do something. So uh, the book I just finished last month was Why the Best of the Best by Kevin Eastman. I think he's been a, a, a guest of yours. And then I got right on. I mean, I, I've heard of her, Angela Duckworth, and I was in the airport. And I saw her book out called Grit, uh, The Power of Passion and, and Perseverance. And she's a psychologist, so sometimes those books are a little hard to read and a little, little wordy. But, man, I picked it up, uh, read it, read about eight chapters in one sitting in the, uh, on the plane. So I'm almost done with that. But that, that's, a, that's a great book because uh, I feel like that has been my success uh, through all my, you know, mistakes and obstacles is I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I think, man, you know, some of my rewards I've had in life has come from grit. You know, uh, one of the worst things that have ever happened in my life. Other people have had worse stories, but for me, my brother died when I was uh, 23 and I got the call from the doctor. And so I had to tell like seven family members. So I had to relive that, you know, that tragedy eight times. And my brother and I were tired of them pantyhose, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it really shook our family up a little bit. A couple of our family members went into some addictions. There almost was some divorces, a suicide attempts. And, you know, to, to, to get through that, man, I, I had to have grit. So Angela talks about that and I can relate to it pretty good. So, you know, if anybody's going through any problems uh, in life, I recommend that book, Grit. Two uh, two great books. And, and I appreciate you sharing a little bit of back, backstory. I'm, I'm sorry for for your brother and for your loss, I, I can't tell you that everybody knows exactly what everybody's going through, but I definitely wanted to just uh, send my condolences to you. And and the one thing about about the book you mentioned, the second book, um, Grit, is that I think it's it's often spoken about, but I think it's a missed concept. And the reason I say that is you talking about being a six foot white guy, myself being a five eleven white guy. Obviously, uh, the numbers and statistics, but you and I couldn't press a button and be six foot four the next day. But the one thing you and I and each and every one of my listeners can work on every single day is our grit. And um, I think that word, that concept grit is something that people take good or bad different ways. But for me, um, it's just the, the essence of just working hard and grinding it out and doing the best. And something you said before is is doing or giving your best. So I wanted to ask you maybe a tough follow-up question, but how do you define grit? Um, shoot, that, that's a whole nother podcast, you know, <laughs> and, you know, 
in, in one word, in one sentence, I would say not focusing on the problem, but working in real time on the solution. You know, uh, I, I, I don't like to bring up race a lot, uh, but I, I feel I have to now because that's the world we live in. And and I hear it. I heard it so much from the outsiders when I grew up because I, I was the only white guy on my basketball team, only white guy in my school, in elementary school, and my high school was 90% black. So I, I got that race thing. And so for me, the, you know, everybody told me the problem. You know, basketball is not a white sport in this area. Bas- you know, you play the white sports. You're a white dude. You're, I mean, I mean, even had coaches say, you're the dumbest white boy I've ever coached. And I'm like, well, coach, I might be the only white dude you've ever coached in this area, you know. And so I heard it all the time. And so for, for grit for me was, you know what, I'm going to focus on what I can control. I can't control my height. I can't control my color. It doesn't matter to me, but I can control getting up at five. I can control how many jump shots I shoot with my left hand and right hand. I got hurt. I broke my hand when I was 12. And so I learned how to shoot the whole summer with my left hand. And so I didn't focus on, hey, I can't play ball right now because my right hand's broken. I went out and said, you know, like Devin Booker right now, one of my uh, players I, I used to work out and one of my coaches who I mentor, Cody Topper, is coaching for the Suns right now. And so he's out there working with Devin Booker on his left hand. And so that's to me, that's grit. You know, hey, I broke my foot um, and uh, had surgery on my on my tibial tendon when I was in Iceland. So I got home and I spent all my money uh, that I made in Iceland on, ins- you know, on surgery because I didn't have ins- had insurance at the time. Iceland couldn't take care of it. I had lived with my parents. So during that time of I'm 27, what am I going to do? I got no money living at home. I started my business. Like, I didn't focus on, woe is me, this sucks, I, you know, I, I focused on, well, here's what I'm going to do the rest of my life, and I started my business speaking at camps in a chair. So I, I showed kids, hey, when you're injured, when you don't have your feet, here's what you can do in basketball, and I did push-ups in a chair, I did shooting in a chair, I did dribbling around a chair, and I got standing ovations, it was phenomenal. And so to me, that's grit, you know, is focusing on what you can do and, and, the, and the solution instead of focusing on what you can't do. And being a victim. No, I, I love that, and I could not, I could not agree more. And I think your definition of not only grit is such great advice. Is it's just in today's day and age. And as we before we went live, we spoke a little bit about backstory about my company and who I am. Is we want to focus on on the solutions. We want to focus on the opportunities. And and that doesn't mean that everything is is sunshine and perfect. Because the reality is, basketball is identical to life. You have your ups, you have your downs, your wins, your losses. But every single day when we wake up, everybody has a chance to put their two feet on the ground. And you can either focus on the good, focus on the bad. You can focus on the problems or you can, as you said, focus on the ways to find solutions. So I'm really glad you touched on that. Yeah, and Chris, let me add something, too, for the listeners out there that, that say, oh, man, that's easy to say, hard to do. Well, that sounds good. And, and they're right. I mean, it, the, the, the thoughts have to become the words. That's the start. But the words then have to become the action. So, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. is not a lot of fun. Like there's so many, you know, mental thoughts pulling you back into bed. And it might be you groggily zombie like walking to the gym at, at 6 a.m. and you don't really get a full lather or you're not in it till 630. But that's fine. You're there. You, you, you showed up. And so when people say showing up and being available, like I spent uh, five, six days with Ray Allen in Europe doing a camp for, for Jordan brand. And that was one of the things he kept saying that, that, that helped him is just being available, just showing up. Just, yeah, it sucks, you know, going to rehab and it sucks, you know, uh, getting yourself to write uh, your book. But you, know, you get writer's block, but just start doing just show up. And it might not come right away. You, you might be in the third quarter, quote unquote, while you're there. But at least you're getting some something done. And then the next day you might start uh, off a little bit earlier. But it's that that grogginess, that zombie like really physically getting yourself to do the next action step to make those top line goals a reality. Because everybody talks about the top line goals, but it's those daily action steps that make those top line goals uh, more of a reality. You know, Does that I, makes sense. No, that, that makes plenty of sense. And one of the things we talk about often with our company is the word accountability. And 
I think what you just said was was spot on with that is your thoughts become your words. But then the most important thing, and this is where I think people kind of miss the boat a little bit, is those thoughts and words, they then need to become action. And it doesn't matter whether you're six foot, five foot, or seven foot. It's great to have the right mindset and thoughts and words, but they are completely irrelevant unless you put in the action. So I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah, and, and you see it all over social media, man. You see these young uh, adults, these young teenagers talk about greatness. Hey, I'm getting after it. I'm grinding. And you wonder, are, are you really? Is it, Or is that, you know, are, what are you doing when nobody's watching? What are you doing, you know, you, like, what are you doing in year five of, of your journey? You know what I mean? It's like people want success now in a year, and they don't understand. It might take you a decade. But with resources and social media now, people can have more success because, you know, when you and I grew up, I mean, it was no social, at least with me, it was no social media. There was no, you know, con- connection between the other continents and, and, and you had to, you know, it just took a while for success. Now that you're a journeyman and a pioneer, people have seen you do it. There's more resources. People are smarter. You know, uh, people expect success quickly and you can get success quickly, but there's still going to be a journey. There's still going to be a grind. And that's my biggest problem with these young adults that I train is that they want success. They want microwave oven success. And sometimes that doesn't, you know, I mean, I know all the time that doesn't happen. I mean, you got to put in the grind. This is a great acronym, grind. I'm grinding. Well, all, all grinding is Greatness resides in nonstop determination. And if, if you can just understand that and embrace that, you know, you'll stick with the process. No, I, I love that acronym. So I wanted to ask you for a minute, before we went live, you told, told me a little bit about your online coaching curriculum. I wanted to just ask if you wouldn't mind just sharing that with us. So if any of our listeners want to find out a little bit more about it or possibly get into some of those things, if you wouldn't mind telling us about that. Yeah, thank you. I have a very thorough, extensive online uh, coaching curriculum and, and playing curriculum. And basically, if you're a coach or a player that wants to learn how to get better at basketball, to, to, to grow their player development, to either learn how to shoot a jump shot or find different ways to, to get their jump shot off to, you know, ways that they can uh, increase their IQ with pick and rolls or game actions or horn sets or anything that involves basketball, offensive and defensive fundamentals. Uh, We have a thorough online curriculum that has about 1,900 videos with PDFs. It it reads like a class. You can get on your mobile devices or PCs. And it's on my website, gannonbakerbasketball.com slash curriculum. And it's G-A-N-O-N-B-A-K-E-R basketball.com. Very, very, very phenomenal online curriculum china uh, a company in china bought the rights to it we're doing hundreds of classes over there and uh, i'm excited about it thanks for asking no i appreciate it and a couple more questions before we let you go but i was curious if you could go back and give the 20 year old version of yourself one piece of advice what would that have been to to build my mind more you know i've always been a rocky you know uh kind of guy train until you can't breathe you get hit you get back up and uh, i would have i would have done a little bit more reading i would have um instead of taking that extra basketball or physical fitness class i would have taken a couple language classes and computer classes (laughs) you know uh the thing the two things that i struggle with now are technology and and language you know i'm in as i said uh i'm in 47 countries at the moment I'm, i'm about to go to india here soon and I just, man, I should have picked up a few more languages. And then social media, you know, uh, the digital world. I, I think I've uh, missed out on some revenue early in my career because I didn't have a grasp of it. I didn't understand it. And when you don't understand something, you kind of, you know, you, you kind of hate on it. So, uh, you know, at 20, I would have read more books, done more research on the future, I guess. No, it's good advice. And I think I would have giving myself that same advice as my father always taught me or challenged me growing up to spend about five minutes more every night just reading something not school related whether it's a book a newspaper yes. article and I always said no 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 and ironically yes. now I read about 100 books a year and he always says to me he said all right so let me get this straight so 
I said five minutes a day and you said, no, no, no. But now you're reading about a hundred books a day. So ironically, you know, things come back to us later on in life. Yes. Agreed. Absolutely. Interesting question for you. If you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would it be and why? Well, I'll, uh, I'll give you two people. Uh, number one, you know, Jesus, just because I, I believe in him so much and I'm a Christian and I'm not religious. Don't get me wrong. I'm not religious, uh, but uh, he's just a, a leader that transformed life over 2,000 years ago. And we're still talking about him. I mean, there have been more books written about him than anybody else in the world. So whether you believe in him or not, I mean, the guy is, is phenomenal. and Everybody knows him. So, But his teachings are really good. And every everybody's self-help book out there um it relates everything to back back what Jesus taught. So I, I, I mean, the guy that you know, whether he did it or not, whether you believe he did it or not, the miracles that he did, I, I want to know how he did it and how did you know just everything about him. And number two, uh, Sylvester Stallone. I mean, you know, I just uh, his story of, I mean, he was a no quit story. And but his, his his Rocky Rocky one two and three just changed my life. And you know. It, it, it's it's not cl- cliche ish. It's not corny. Like to me, those movies got me to stop being a victim. It got me tougher. It made me realize that that art can become life, and that uh, you know the lessons that he portrayed in that move in that series through his character transcends into my life, and I still use it. So. You know, everybody has to get motivated somehow. Rocky, you know, that, that Rocky really changed my life. People understand that, but but I do. And so those are two people that dead and alive that man, if I could, if I could have dinner with them, we'd have a great meal. No, I uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, with that. And and Rocky and Sylvester Stallone, it's it is the the true no quit story. And whether you're a boxing fan or not, it's a movie that you know makes sense as far as you get knocked down, but you got to get back up. Yeah, and and his his brand, like the way he started his brand, you know, he sold his dog. Nobody thought he was smart enough. He he had a uh, learning disability. Uh, you know, he was cast different. Nobody believed in him. So uh, he wrote he wrote his life in three three days. He got a so it, it was it's deep. I mean, Rocky, you know, Sylvester Stallone is a genius, and uh, it, it should give people hope that it's not really how smart you are how lucky you are it's your grit it's your resolve it's your faith in yourself no i couldn't uh, i couldn't agree more so again before we let you go i wanted to ask if you have some parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners well chris you've been professional man thank you for having me uh again i'm just an average guy doing extraordinary things and i think you know if you have an idea out there if you have a uh a a, a bucket list no matter how old you are uh, no matter how young you are you know you need to take it seriously. I think we're all giving gifts and some is to lead, some is to serve, you know, there's greatness inside of you, no question. And you, you might not feel that because you've made some mistakes, uh, your fault and then not your fault. And I just want to let people know that you can be great and still not be perfect. You know, you can be great and still not have all the answers. People think that, you know, you become great and now you have to live under this, you know, paradigm that, man, you have all the answers and you can't mess up. And well, this world will crucify you if you do mess up. That's true. But, you know, we live in the greatest country in the world. And I think people will uh, respect your no quit attitude, respect your persistence. And and so a lot of times that I'm almost quit because I didn't feel that I was good enough or had to be super, super smart. And all I had to do was was cultivate my gift. You know, and so I focus on two things every day to keep me moving and and help me be a valuable asset in life and what I do and then in my family. And that's number one, focus on what I love. You know, if you focus on what you love and and whether it's a person, place or thing, just focus on that and try to build that. And, And most of the time, all the time, what you love is your gift. And number two, uh, focus on who loves you. You know, everybody has a family. If you don't have a family, everybody has a friend. You got some support staff, some bigger than others, but there's people in this world that love you. Focus on them because if you focus on technology or if you look at social media, there's so many critics and haters and 
you know, you could put out the best stuff in the world. Somebody's going to uh, crap on it. Somebody's going to dislike it. And you can't really focus on that. And, and so if you could just stay in that lane with, with those two, you know, that compass there, what do you love and who loves you? Man, that'll that'll get you on to doing what you love for the rest of your life, and you'll have peace, and you'll have a, a valuable uh, place on this earth, man. That's that's great, great parting advice, especially for for our no quit tribe. And then, last question for you is is as you mentioned uh, the website, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you as well? Are you on social media also, or just through your websites? I am. I'm on um, my website, email. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on YouTube. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't think I'm on Snapchat. My, my team tells me they're not doing that, so that's good because I'll get my <laughs> Snapchat mixed up with my MySpace, and they told me it's MySpace is not there anymore. So, <laughs> but but you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google me, uh, email, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on WeChat. If there's any Asian visitor, you know, visitors to the podcast, so I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty easy to find. And the one thing that I've always done is. I always try to answer every question that relates to building somebody's life up or, or uh, if it's business related. So we, we answer all uh, messages and we'd love to hear from you. Well, listen, Gannon, I truly, truly appreciate not only your time, but also some of the amazing stuff you share with us. And I definitely hope that our listeners connect with you. And then any of uh, our listeners that are in the coaching world uh, definitely would recommend that they check out your online coaching curriculum as well. Thank you, Chris. I enjoyed our flow today. Thank you for listening to episode number 166. Gannon is quite an impressive individual, and I believe the word grit perfectly defines him, who he is, and how he gets after it each and every single day. Gannon shared some really great stuff on today's show, but I want to touch upon a few things. Gannon mentioned that everybody wants the power and the byproducts of being the best, but you need to go through the champion's pain, and that is not something that everybody is willing to do. Gannon mentioned how at first our thoughts become our words, and then our words need to become our actions. I think that is a part that we all don't focus enough on. Even if you have the most perfect thoughts and the most amazing words, you still need to take action. We briefly spoke about social media, and Gannon posed a question that I absolutely loved. He asked, what are you doing when no one is watching? When we were discussing grit throughout today's episode, Gannon shared one thing that absolutely hit me head on. He said that grit is not focusing on the problem, but working in real time on the solution. So in conclusion of today's episode, I want to ask you one very simple question. In life, when you face challenges, obstacles, or those tough times, do you focus on the problem, the negative, or do you work on finding a solution? Life is never always perfect or always easy. Not for me, not for you, not for Gannon or anyone else. So in honor of today's theme, grit, grind it out, be gritty, work hard, and go for your greatness. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.